today's content. So, welcome to week five. This is the last bit of content that you guys need to absorb before the midterm. Congratulations. Um, it's not a particularly difficult topic. That having been said, it's still a topic that needs to be covered. Um, this one bridges the concepts between design and physical implementation. Because these are things you put in place as part of the design process, but you actually do it at the physical stage when you've made the database. That's when these things come into effect. So specifically, I'll be talking about indexes and views. All right. so. It's a split topic. Um, so the first half of the lecture is indexes, the second half is views. Indexes is an odd topic because you could either spend half a lecture talking about indexes or spend five lectures talking about indexes. There's really no in between. Uh, you guys are getting the half a lecture version um, because my level of relational algebra is not high enough to do the five lecture version. I just know what they do and how you use them. So, which is pretty much the most important part. So, indexes. Um, we're going to talk about what the purpose of an index is, um, the, how to define them, how they're organized, uh, the kinds of indexes, uh, some basic rules, and some examples on how to create them. And then we're going to talk about views, and we're going to define what views are, create, uh, show you a couple of examples, uh, discuss the type of views, and some examples for those views. And during the views, there's a good chance I'll bring up a specific kind of view that MySQL does not support that pretty much everybody else does. But I, it's important that you guys know it exists, but it's not in MySQL. So you guys are spared labs about that topic. So most database queries usually need just a little bit coming out of the database. Even if you have millions of rows, when you pull up a customer's record, you probably just need the customer's information, their address. Let's say it's a, a financial system, so you might need to know what orders or invoices they have outstanding, that kind of thing. But realistically, in the grand scheme of things, pulling back 25 records is nothing. Now, let's say we're talking about a really big database, multi-million rows, billions of rows. I mean... One of the databases at work is sitting at uh, close to 400 million rows of data. It's all historical data, but there's still 400 million rows of data. So this is a lot of data. Now imagine if the only way to get the information was to actually do what they call a table scan. So you go select star from table where some criteria, and it literally goes, row one, does this match the criteria? Row two, does this match the criteria? And it does it you know, 10 million times. It's going to take a while. No matter how fast the computer is, a table scan is slow. It's as if I asked you to go find something in the textbook and you were not allowed to use the index at the back of the page. You weren't allowed to look at the table of contents. And you couldn't look at the index. You had to go page by page until you found the topic. Yes, the computer can do it fast, but it's still not going to be fast. It's really inefficient. So indexes help us speed up our queries so we don't have to search the entire database. Um, and actually, there's the analogy <laughs> that I just used, talking about, you know, looking through a textbook. But, you know, in a textbook, you have an index at the back. So if you're trying to find a specific topic, you look it up, it'll say you'll find it on page 56, 60, and 85. So you can go look through the three pages and see where the topic is. If you didn't have that and you didn't have a table of contents, looking through books would be really, really slow. So. Hello. Um, so the definition of an index, it's a data structure that's used to speed up data retrieval. Um, it has a series of keys that's used to identify uh, columns in the, uh, in the table. And what's strange about indexes is you can see the definition when you look at the structure of the database, say MySQL Workbench or some other graphical tool, you can adjust its parameters, but you can never see what's in it. Indexes are invisible to you. As in, you know they're there, and that's all you get to know about it. Um, but they do a lot of magic things. 
So it's basically a database structure and it maintains information about records. Specifically what it does is it maintains the location of the records in a given table. Um, so it basically looks up specific things and it knows where to go into the table to find it. There's certain things in database tables that you guys don't see. Um, I'm not sure how MySQL does it, but I know how Postgres does it and how Oracle does it. And Microsoft SQL Server is very similar too. So you know how you look at a record in a table and you'll see the columns you've defined, right? An ID and some other columns and stuff like that. Fantastic. But there's actually a couple of hidden columns that you don't see. And with Oracle, there's at least two. One is the record identifier, which has nothing to do with the primary key. It just identifies the record. The other one is an actual physical address of where it is on the disk. So if it's not in memory, it knows specifically what sector and byte to go grab that record from. Really cool. Postgres has something called object IDs, or it used to. Nowadays, it uses some other scheme, but it's very similar. Um, you just can't interact with it. But you can, it knows in the index for certain matches that it's a certain object ID. And then based on that, it knows where to go get it in the, in the off the disk. Like I said, I don't know what MySQL does. I'm assuming it does something similar. I just don't know how its internals work specifically. So primary keys are automatically indexed. Second, you create something as a primary key, it creates a unique index. It's created right away. You don't get to control it. You get no say on it. So when you need to look something up by primary index, so you go select star from customer where customer ID is equal to 72, it knows to use the index because you're referring to the primary key. So it'll actually search against the index instead of doing a table scan. You can index a combination of other fields, one field, two field, three fields in the same table. Um, they are called secondary indexes. Uh, normally they're called non-unique indexes. Although it is possible to create more than one unique index on a table. Um, the primary key will always be unique index. Obviously it doesn't allow duplicate values, but one of the common uses for another unique index I've seen is email address. You don't want customers using the same email address twice. Odds are if somebody's logging in using an email address, you probably want to index it so that that first search is fast. Therefore, you don't want duplicates, you make it unique, you want it indexed, so you use a unique index in that case. Um, some people are ambivalent about using multiple unique indexes because you have to add extra programming code to handle errors when you try to insert something that's, you know, uh, duplicated. So, if we were to create an index on a name and the most common type of index is known as a B plus tree. And a B tree index only ever has four levels, but it can fan out to hundreds wide. A picture it almost like an upside down tree. Um, fun fact, I always thought that the B and B tree stood for binary tree. No, no, it literally stands for best tree. Best. Just best, best tree. You know, for years I was under the impression it was called binary tree because, you know, it makes sense because it's dividing everything in twos, right? No, no, it's best tree. Um, I actually found that in a textbook about four years ago and I'm like, damn, I've been saying that for like 12 years and I've been wrong. So, oh, well, you know, you live and learn. I've been doing this for 26 years and I'm still learning stuff all the time. So the way B trees work is it takes the values in the table and divides them over and over and over again. So for example, if you're gonna guess a number between one and 10, what's the first number you guess? No, five. And then you'll be told if it's higher or lower. So then what do you, what's the next number you pick? The division between that number and yeah. So one to five or five to 10, so it'd be three or seven. The next guess will be higher or lower, and you'll basically have the answer. B trees work in a very similar manner, where you take the data, it divides it. So, for example, you could do the first division would be potentially A to M, 
n to z. The next level might be a to e, f to m. Onwards and onwards. Mind you, I'm being super simplistic here because really that first level might be divided four ways or five ways. And the next one down, for every division this way, will keep growing. Yes. It tries. The issue is when you start having data that's added and deleted on a regular basis, where suddenly you might delete a bunch of things out of one chunk. So let's say you have an index on postal codes. You know, A1A, 1A1 at one end and Z1Z, 1Z1 at the other end. And you start dividing it. And suddenly you decide that you're not going to sell anything to Quebec. So you delete all the postal codes in Quebec. I'm picking on the Quebecers today, apparently. But suddenly you'll have a big gap in the middle of the index where the Quebec ones would have resided. So suddenly your index gets imbalanced to address his specific question. Often what happens there is on a regular basis, like every once in a while, good database engines will do a, what they call an index rebuild. So it'll rescan the data and rebuild the indexes. It takes a long time, depending on how much data you have. Um, bad database engines, you have to manually do it. Uh, last time I checked, you always have to manually do it in MySQL because it's special that way. Uh, Oracle does it automatically. Postgres will do it automatically if you turn on the, the, the option. Um, but Postgres doesn't use B trees as much. They use a different kind of tree for their indexes, which is, tends to be a little more sane. All right, so back to my, continuing with that example of how to divide stuff. So let's just say we have a division of the database into three chunks at first. So we have, it starts with everything to F, Z at the other end, and then broken down in the middle. And then that first division could theoretically be B, D, and F, and then you could have everything in A, including the B, the D would have another one, and then the F would have a third. So it just tries to intelligently divide how the data is stored in the disk. Um, so the average time to find the desired data depends on the depth of the tree and just how much data there is. Um, obviously, if it has to go four layers deep, it's going to be slower than if it only goes three layers deep. Um, but by the same token, if the layer is 500 things wide, that's also going to take a little while because it has to figure out where it falls into that pile, right? Um, like if you've got some odd data in there, for example, you've got aardvark, which starts with two A's. Well, it, it's going to be sorted out differently than, you know, adventure because it's AD. So that's what indexes do on the inside. And there's another one called a hashing algorithm. And hashing algorithm is slightly different. Instead of doing a division, it creates hashes. And do you guys know what a hash is? Some of you said yes, some of you just said no. A hash is a fingerprint of the data. So when you read a file, you read a string, you read a number, it will have a specific matching hash. So if you do an MD5, it'll look a certain way. If you do what they call an SHA1 or an SHA256, those are different ways of fingerprinting. It's not encrypting. Because a hash is one way. Once it's turned into a hash, you can never know what it was before. Um, so what the hashing algorithm will do is it stores a hash of the data and then a piece of data tells it where it is in the file. So that way it does need to keep everything sorted. It just needs to look, it keeps the hash sorted. It reads the hash and goes and finds it in the pile. Um, often, depending on the size of the data, they won't use particularly large hashes um, because hashes can take up a lot of room. If I pull up, just so you guys have an idea.
So there's what a hash looks like. And it basically stores those sorted. So when it search, searches, it converts what you're looking for into a hash. And then it matches. The thing about hashes is they're very, very fast. However, there's limits. If I generate this over and over and over again, you'll notice that the hash stays the same. But the second I change even one letter, the hash changes. And all I did is I changed from uppercase to lowercase i. So hashes are fast if you don't need to be case sensitive. Hashes are slow. Actually, let me rephrase that. Hashes will not work if you need to be case insensitive because it is one way. It doesn't change. So once you degenerate a hash, that's what it is. So this is really fast because you can search for exact res values exactly the way the data is. It'll find the hash. It'll tell you, and then it tells the database engine, it's here in the database. Go read from this position. All right. So unique and non-unique indexes. So unique indexes are usually done as part of the primary key. Uh, they have been called primary indexes in the past. So you may come across some documentation on the internet when you're learning, learning about indexes, if you want to look stuff up, that talk about primary indexes. Um, it's just that unique indexes are usually done for primary keys, but technically you could apply it to other fields you want to keep unique. Like I said, email address is a popular one. Uh, I've seen phone number as another one that's often kept unique, depending on what kind of database you're looking at. Um, Non-unique indexes are often done for fields used to search for things or to group data. Um, Things that you also find find all regularly. Again, phone number is a popular one to index. Email address, another one. Uh, city, uh, postal code slash zip code, um, product categories, that kind of thing. And the syntax is actually pretty straightforward. And you go create unique index. You give it a name. You call it whatever you want. It doesn't care. Um, a popular semi-popular way is to throw on a suffix saying what kind of index it is. So uh, PK, FK, or just IDX for just a regular run-of-the-mill index. Then you, so you go create index, you give it a name on, you list the table, and then you list the uh, column or columns. You kind of specify multiple columns, uh, comma delimited. Um, you often want to index foreign keys. It makes your joins go faster. Um, good database engines often will. Let me rephrase that. Database engines that allow you to have the option to automatically index foreign keys. It's a common thing that you can just turn on. Postgres allows it. Microsoft SQL Server has it. Oracle has it. Um, I don't know if MySQL has it. It might have it buried somewhere in the gajillion options it has that. It's really undocumented, um, but you tend to want to index foreign keys also because it makes your joins fast. Um, I can give you guys a bit of an example of a performance boost that you get. So at my day job, we have this one system where we, when a customer retrieves what we call a license file, so our software is locked to hardware, whether it's a physical dongle or we lock it to the person's PC, it's locked. So when they update their hardware information, they need a fresh license file. When it retrieves a license file, the query itself, when last time I printed it, 12 point font occupied a page and a half of SQL, one query, a single command. There's uh, four unions and an accept in it on top of uh, you know a good, about 12 joins. It's a really big query. And it runs really, really fast. But it was getting slower and slower and slower. And I'm going, why is this so slow? One day I went digging through the database and I realized that no, at no point had anybody ever indexed the foreign key, one of the foreign keys. I indexed the foreign key. The, query, the, the retrieval of the license file went from about four seconds to approximately uh, 250 milliseconds. Like It's not just like it's twice as fast or three times as fast. It was like a, th like a thousand times faster. 
It was insane. Uh, just mind you, creating the index took almost 20 minutes because there was just so much data tied to it. But that having been said, once that 20 minutes of pain for everybody was done, it was lightning, lightning fast. Everybody thought we bought a new server because it was just so much quicker and it was literally typing in create index. So there's a few rules when you create using indexes. You want to use them on larger tables, obviously, because the more data there is, the slower the retrievals are going to be. Uh, you index the primary key of each table. Uh, pretty much every database server does this automatically. It's a you know a no brainer. Usually you retrieve records using the primary key when you're pulling for a specific record. Therefore, it's always indexed. You want to index search fields. Um, so these are fields that are frequently used in the where clause. Email address, phone number, names, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes you want to take care of the ones in the order by and the group by. It's useful to have those because, again, it'll speed that process up also. Now, that last one is kind of funny now. Um, that last point was really valid about 15, 20 years ago when we had mechanical hard drives. So you'd index when there's over 100 values, but not less when there's less than 30. Realistically, now I really need to update that slide. I just keep forgetting every time. You know, I just keep forgetting to update it. Really. You want to index when there is over, you know, even over a hundred values, but anything under a hundred, you don't need to worry about indexing. Um, and even then really you could go index for anything over a thousand rows. The NVMe drives in our computers and the RAID arrays and big servers are so efficient at pulling data now that yes, indexes improve performance, but it's not as important as it used to be for small size volumes. So if you're talking about huge volumes of data, yes, smaller volumes, not necessarily important. Uh, the key is though, is you just keep an eye on how fast or slow your queries are getting. And then you want to try to index that as much as possible. All right. So you want to avoid using indexes for fields with long values. Um, Maybe you want to compress the values first. By compressing the values, we mean uh, getting rid of punctuation, white space, that kind of thing. You want to actually store a clean version of whatever it is you're searching. Um, because the longer the data, the bigger the data stored in the index. Um, if the key is used to determine the location of record, try to use surrogate keys. Uh, because numeric keys will spread evenly, nicely. Um, some database servers might actually have limits on how many indexes per table, and even the number of bytes per indexed field. Um, not as common as it used to be. Old versions of Oracle had a limitation. Uh, old versions of Microsoft SQL Server and Sybase had that limitation. Uh, MySQL used to be extra special. But realistically, nowadays, there's not a lot of limits. But the other one you have to watch is you want to avoid indexing fields that might have nulls in it. Because, so picture how this works. You type in a, a select statement, select star from table where city is equal to something. And the way it works is the database server receives the command. It parses the command to make sure there's no syntax errors. Then it hands off that command to what's called a query optimizer. The query optimizer looks at all the pieces in your query and it goes, do I have any indexes that match some of this information? Like, do we have an index on city? And just city, because we're only talking about city. And it goes, yes. So it'll use that index. Now, the issue when you have nulls is if there's null values, those will get excluded out of the index. So if it's using the index to filter your where clause, it's never going to see the fields that have nulls in them. So if you're going select star from customers where city is not equal to Ottawa, you'll get everybody that is not in Ottawa, but you'll also get 
nothing with nulls. So you want to avoid um, indexing fields that are, that are optional because, well, you might just end up excluding stuff um, because literally once it uses the index to search for the data, it doesn't actually look at the raw data in the table. It looks just what's in the index. So what that's called is a um, index hit. So it hits the index, looks up where things are, only retrieves the things it finds in the index, and it's blind to the actual contents of the table. So you just have to be careful. All right. There's a, when you go to create indexes, uh, I already showed you a bit of an example earlier, but the syntax is create index, give it a name, on, and you define it. So if we create an index like our first one, create index, double index on person, and we're indexing age and city, it will help with the first query, which is select star from person, where age is 55 and city is equal to Seattle. But it will not help the second one, because when you create an index, it will match exactly. So the query optimizer looks and goes, do I have an index that has city? Yes, oh, but wait, this index also has age, so I can't use this index. It will only work, so let's say our where clause had age, city, and gender. It would help with that one because age and city are both there. So at least it would use the index to filter out that set. And then it'd worry about the gender after the fact. But it can never use an index that has more columns defined in it than what you're searching for. So if you're searching for one, but all your indexes have two columns, congratulations, it's going to do a table scan. Yes. Yes. If you had an, an index on age and an index on city, then the query optimizer would actually use the both indexes to help filter it down. So a common strategy is to create single column indexes. And um, there is catches with creating indexes and towards the end, I'll discuss them. Uh, but just don't let me forget to talk about some of the catches. So, Indexes are also good for range queries. So if you're looking between a range, um, so create age index on person age helps in this because it's a range. The index is very good at figuring out positions of things by value. So it knows everything in that range because it's going to do it quickly. So why not create indexes on everything? Which actually, I remember putting that question in there to remind myself about the gotchas. All right. so. Indexes are a strange creature because some people tend to go on the side of, let's do lots of indexes. It's not going to hurt anything. Performance will be fine. No, it's not. Indexes affect all kinds of things that you don't see because you don't actually see indexes. You don't realize what's actually happening. So number one, indexes affect I.O. If you don't know what I.O. is, input, output. It af affects performance of writes. So let's say we are creating a record. There is no index except for the primary key. I.O. operation number one, write the record. I.O. operation two, update the primary key index. It's done. Fantastic. Now, on the other hand, we're going to do an insert into a table that has three indexes on top of the primary key. Write the first record, IO operation number one. Update the primary key index, IO operation number two. Read index, the first index. Figure out where it needs to put the information. So at this point, we might be setting at three IO operations just for that. One IO operation to write it. Rinse and repeat for every index. So suddenly you're adding one row to the database, but you are causing 100 I.O. operations. Yes, computers are fast. If your indexes are indexing 500 million rows, it's going to take a little while to, you know, do the magic sauce. That's issue number one with indexes. So you don't want to index everything because you're just going to up 
IO operations. Issue number two, index collision. And there's another technical term, uh, but I don't remember what it is, but index collision. So what happens is if you create a bunch of different indexes with a combination of columns, name, age, name and age, city, you know, and a couple of other different com common combinations of what people search for. What'll happen is if you have a situation where multiple indexes could be used and the database server is not, it has something what they call query statistics. So it looks at the stats. It keeps stats in memory all the time. But if it can't find a combination of queries that will make it go fast, it says, I don't know what to do. Table scan. Literally. I've had a case where um, I inherited a database where people were complaining about how slow everything was. This was a long time ago, and I wasn't as seasoned as I am now, so it took me a long time to figure out what was happening. And the person who had created the database really didn't understand the impact of indexes. And he literally indexed everything. All the columns were indexed. Combinations of columns were indexed. There was an index that had everything in it. Why? Because the person said, it's not going to hurt anything. So it got to the point where every single time we looked up a customer record in that database, it did a full table scan of all 250,000 rows for all 500 users. It's not ideal when you do a search and it takes uh, 30 to 40 seconds for it to decide if it's even going to search because it doesn't know what to do. So you don't index everything because it causes the query optimizer to get confused. Confused query optimizers are designed to be smart in the sense of it's not going to blow up and fail. It's going to go, I'm not sure what to do with this at all. So I'm going to go with the path of least resistance and what is probably the safest. And we're going to table scan. At least you're going to get results. It's not going to be fast, but it's going to do the job. And issue number three, disk space. Yes, we all have 500 gig drives, terabyte drives. Data centers have database space and, you know, insane amounts of terabytes. Um, you know, if you create a, an RDS instance on Amazon, whether it's MySQL or Postgres or Oracle, um, if I remember correctly, uh, the current maximum of a single database instance is 100 terabytes. Oh, they got bigger than that, but then that's a different kind of database engine, but you can go up to 100 terabytes. People think, ah, space is not that much, but I've seen cases where the index has occupied more room than the actual table. Because again, let's say each row occupies 500 bytes. So two rows is 1K. Great. Roughly 1K. Don't shoot me. But the 24 bytes I'm missing. So roughly 1K per two rows. And you have 10 indexes. Each of those indexes might be occupying 200, 200 bytes. So suddenly your 10 indexes are occupying, you know, almost double the space of just the actual row of data. We get back to our spot where suddenly we have a million rows and our indexes are double the size of the actual data in the database. And every time you do an IO operation, it gets slow because it's dealing with big files. Or it's sitting in memory, which is another problem. Because uh, indexes, when they get used, often get cached in memory. So the whole thing goes into memory. And if the memory's full of indexes, there's not a lot of room for anything else to happen, right? So it's constantly unloading stuff and reloading stuff in and out of memory. So indexes are great. Use them. Don't abuse them. Okay, any questions about indexes? That's actually the, the the last part was more doom and gloom than the whole, the rest of the lecture so far. But yes, it's a good tool, but you just don't want to overdo it. It's like drinking Rockstar. You drink one Rockstar, you're a little happy. You drink 10, you're dead. You know, you don't want to overdo anything. All right, so now we're going to dive into views.
So views are treated as relations. They are basically treated as a table, but they are not physically stored. Views can be used for a bunch of different things. You could use it to hide data from specific users. So you have an application and depending on who they are, it actually changes what view is used. Um, an example here is creates a view and there's the syntax creating a view is you create view, give it a name as, and then after that is whatever standard SQL statement you want to use, like any select statement. It could be big, could be small, could be complex, could be simple, but it's a full SQL statement regardless. So the way this view is set up is developers would only see employees that are in the development department. So, you know, you did select star from developers, you'd only get employees in the developers department. But if somebody did select star from employee, they get everything else. Um, that's a super simplified view of what a view is. Um, other uses for views I've seen over the years is to hide really complicated queries. Um, for example, I have uh, a really old mailing system at my day job that we still use. We're trying to get rid of it, but it just works so well that it's hard to get rid of. But it's been around for 14 years, so it really is. I mean, it was written to run on Windows 2000. But it's still running today. Not on Windows 2000, but it's still running today. Um, and the you can write SQL in it, but the problem is it has problems when the SQL gets a little too fancy. So what we end up doing is creating views for the really complicated queries. And then you could just select that view as a table. So you go, you know, I want to grab the records from this table. And because the view hides the complicated query, it basically allows the software to run. Um, often used for reports. So if you've got uh, many reports, you can write a report engine that basically pulls things from the view list of views, defined in a certain way, and you can do reports that way. So views in MySQL are known as what's dynamic views. They don't store any data. They are always up to date. They are loaded at runtime every time the query is run. So essentially, um, after you've created a view, as defined there, you go select star from view name. What it'll do is it'll go, hey, I know this is an object in the database. Oh, it's not a table, it's a view. So then it asks the database server, so what's the content of the view? And then it executes that. So what's really cool about views is you can, it looks like a table. It smells like a table, but it's not a table. There's limitations with views, and I'll be talking about some of those limitations later. But it's kind of really nifty um, the way it works. So there's a view, and it's create Seattle view as, and you don't have to have the word view. You can just call it whatever you want. Uh, my day job, we actually go V underscore and whatever it's called so that you know all the views are all grouped together when we look through the engine browser. Um, and the way this is working is it's grabbing the buyer, the seller, the product in the store from persons. It's joining a table called purchase. And there's the on clause where, you know, the person's city is Seattle. So it'll create a, what's called a virtual table. It looks like a table. You can use it like a normal table. It'll respect where clauses. It'll respect joins. It will even use underlying indexes. And the performance hit is negligible. Like there is a performance hit for using a view, but we're talking, you know, thousands of milliseconds, like just a couple of milliseconds while it figures out if it's a view or not. That's the only impact for using a view. And going forward, we could actually use the view and here we're using a uh, the old kind the old style join instead of a modern join. We go select name comma store from the view comma product. We define the join, and then we can go product category equals shoes. So it will execute the view 
and then do the rest of the operations against it. So a view is not a true table, as I just said. It's a virtual table that doesn't actually have any data. It just has a definition. Um, my database prof when I was in college would, you know, be very angry if he heard what I'm about to say next. But a view is like a bookmark in your browser. It has a short little name that gives you a nice big fat URL. The URL may change every time you load it because web pages constantly change depending on, you know, what sites you're going to. But the URL we're using doesn't change and the bookmark we set for it also likely does not change. Yeah, pretty much. It's basically a, it's something in the database that defines what you're trying to look for. Um, whenever you query the view, it will literally access the data as if you wrote the big long query yourself. There's no difference. Um, now, this also means that if you need to modify the data, it is very difficult to do it through a view. It is possible to do it, but you have to create your view a very specific way. And the more complicated your view, the more complicated that process gets. So as a rule of thumb, the industry treats views as non-updatable. You create view, you can't insert into a view, you can't update a view, you can't delete from a view. You have to do that raw to the table, not through the view. Views are for looking at things because you know, you're viewing the data. So earlier, what happens, and this is where the database servers are really, really smart. That's where, you know, you realize that the people that wrote the database engines are way smarter than you are. Um, or I can't say that there might be somebody in here that's, you know, to that caliber of education. But uh, I have the utmost respect for these people. So if you take that first query, which we had earlier, which was basically a join with the view, um, it actually will take that and convert it into that lower query. So it'll actually take the view, expand it into the, the full fat query, and then slap on the extra stuff you, you defined. Um, how does it do it? I have no idea. I'll be honest. There's so much happening inside that engine that I, and every database engine will do this slightly differently. Um, so it will create the initial query and then it'll add on the extra join that you had and then continue building the rest. Uh, it's quite nifty the way it works. But this is where different database engines behave slightly differently. I've noticed that this is what MySQL does and this is what Oracle does. Microsoft SQL Server, not quite. Microsoft SQL Server actually runs the view and treats it as a table. It doesn't expand the view and then build around it. It ex literally ex executes the view and then treats it as a result. Uh, did you guys learn about subqueries last term? Did you learn about derived tables? A derived table? I'll write an example so you guys know what I'm talking about. That is a derived table. It is executes the subquery, and then it does the outside. And this is as mighty as that. So Microsoft SQL Server treats the view as a derived table. And I'm 90% sure Postgres does the same thing. So Different database engines will do things a little bit differently. So realistically, as far as you're concerned as a database developer, you don't care. It will do it regardless. It's just one will do a query expansion and then get clever. Other ones don't. 
Um, I'm sure there's advantages to both. But realistically, you'll never notice it. All right, so there's two kinds of views. There's virtual views, or also known as dynamic views. And those are used in a database, obviously. Um, but the, by a database, they're talking about transactional database. So because they're always up to date, they're computed on demand, you run the query with the view, it looks at the live data, fantastic. Materialized views, on the other hand, they're used in data warehousing. And what's strange about this is the term data warehousing in this case is a little ambivalent. It's because data warehousing is a term of storing summarized data. You don't, you, you'll store the raw data as is, but often the data warehouse, you're st storing summarized views of the data. It's pre-computed offline. So in other words, you, you create the materialized view. The data exists in that materialized view. It literally exists. It basically creates a, an invisible table with the actual data in it. So it's a little bit slower when you create it, but the searches will be faster because it's not actually executing, you know, a query with 25 joins. It's going to look at that one thing with that one row of results. However, it may have stale data because the materialized views do not update all the time. You create it, the data is set. The data will not change in that view until you refresh it. MySQL does not have materialized views. There's ways to fake it by literally creating tables, running the view and inserting the results of the view into this table. So you end up truncate the table, insert the data, truncate the table, insert the data, which is why the MySQL developers never saw a point of creating materialized views because you can work around it. Just because everybody else has them doesn't mean they want it. Um, but yes, so the cool part about materialized views is if you have this running as a nightly job, and I actually have several at work that I run on one of our databases because the sales reps like running reports regularly. And I have some a couple different views. There's one that runs nightly. So basically summarizes the previous day's sales. Another one runs once a week. It summarizes the weekly sale. One runs them once a month because it summarizes the month view. And the special thing about that is they can run a report. It pulls up on their dashboard almost instantly because the data is always summarized. It doesn't need to compute. It doesn't do any math. It doesn't need to retrieve any data. It just literally reads the rows raw and gives it to you. Um, so they have their place. You can just work around it. So if we want to create an updatable view, in other words, we want to insert into a view. And we have a table as follows. Employee has SSN, name, department, project, and salary. So we create a view as such, which is back to our original view I discussed earlier about selecting employees that work in development. And we do insert into developers, Joe and optimizer. So basically the person's name is Joe and the project is optimizer because the view has two columns. You can only refeed it two values. And what it'll do is it'll turn it into that at the bottom. You'll notice that the SSN, which I'm assuming is the primary key, does not get populated. The department doesn't get populated. and the uh, salary does not get populated. Now, theoretically, the department and the salary could allow calls, but the social security number cannot allow nulls because it's probably the primary key. What's going to happen if you try to insert something that's of a primary key? And it's not obviously using a synthetic key that does it automatically for you. No, it's not going to let you because primary keys are not null. You try to insert a null into a not null, what do you get? An error message. So to create an updatable view, um, you have two, well, that's not right. 
you have to include any key columns. So if you want to be able to update the view, you have to include the primary key in the view so that you can populate said primary key. If there's foreign keys that are required, you have to include those into the view. At this point, what's the point of even using a view? If you're going to supply the entire table structure so if somebody can insert into the view, why bother use the view to do the insert in the first place? Ditto for the, up, for the update. And same thing for the delete. You go delete from developers where, theoretically, you could go where name is equal to Joe, but if there's more than one Joe, you delete all the Joes because you can't target the primary key. So, yes, you can have updatable views. No reason not to create them, except for the fact that you have to expose every sensitive bit of that table for it to work. And if you're going that far, don't. Use the views to summarize data. Don't try to use it to insert values. Obviously, there are edge cases and there are cases for this purpose. Um, over the years, I'm sure I've come across a few. But honestly, there's not one that's standing out to me that I can use that as an example at this moment. So that tells you just how useful that is. All right. So if we want to update views in MySQL, there are um, a couple of different ways. And depending on the database engine, it will do certain things. So the first one is create or replace view. You give it a name as, and I'm trying to remember why that bottom box is there and I can't remember off the top of my head why it's there. Ignore the bottom box. Create a, or replace a view with the name as, and then you just redefine the view. Now, there's limitations on the or replace. So create or replace is cool because create will go, hey, I want to create this. Oh, it already exists. Oh, you're telling me I'm allowed to replace it. Let's replace it. And it will work as long as you don't change the columns coming back. Let's say you're updating the where clause or you're adding a join so that you can filter the where a little bit better, but you don't change the columns coming back. The replace will work. The second, let's say you're going from two columns to three columns, replace will not work. It just goes no. It gives you some weird error message and then it bombs out. Um, I might be wrong about some database engines. Some of them may allow it. Uh, I know that Clean MySQL did not, and Postgres did not also, uh, which leads me to think that probably Oracle doesn't either. Um, so if you want to do that, how do you fix it? You drop the view and then recreate it. Sometimes to build a new house, you got to burn the old house down first. And this is actually explaining what I was literally talking about a minute ago. Um, I prevent, there's a link on here that literally tells you how to create updatable views. If you really want to know how to create updatable views, go read that. I'm not spending any more time on it. Um, and if you want to drop a view, very simple syntax. Uh, drop view, and if you want to be safe, throw in the if exists. That way you don't get an error message if it doesn't exist. Uh, give it the view name with a semicolon and hit go. And the view just goes away. It's instant. Um, literally, it is instant. Now, if I go pull up MySQL real quick, just so I can show you guys the view. Uh, hello. Yeah, that's I'm having a stupid day. Actually, let's go airports. So, you know, you guys have seen SQL before. This is nothing new. Uh, if this is new to you, you were sleeping through your first level, especially this particular statement, select star from one table. However, uh, I can create a view uh, like um, hang on. First thing I want to do is we're going to add a where clause on here. Go 
So we want to have a review for anything that has an elevation over 1,500 feet. So I can create a view like this, go uh, high airports as, and I hit run. And yeah, no kidding, eh? All right, so I created the view and you'll see it says zero rows effect is fantastic. So now in theory, I can go And there it is. It does the exact same thing, but now it doesn't include the other, th the last of it. Uh, if I wanted to uh, join, no, that's all one word. Like that, and I want to go uh, high airports dot name comma airlines dot name. Oh, it's uh, I haven't used this database. Oh, come on. It really helps if you're actually uh, paying attention to where it's you're typing. Oh, airport's ID on on clause. Eh? There we go. That didn't make me look stupid at all. Um, taking me five tries to write that one SQL statement. Anyways, so you can see here that it literally is behaving just like a normal table. I am reading from it. But you will notice that I do have to reference it as if it was the actual table name and not just a view name. Um, if I try to replace, hang on, let me go, 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 go. No, that's not it. Edit, and it's too late now. Okay. Like that, and it's airport. I, yeah, that one's fine. Okay, like this. Of course I don't. So let's say I wanted to change my high airports so that it's always like that. So I could go create or replace view high airports as uh, select airports.name comma airlines.name from airports join routes routes dot source airport ID is equal to airports dot ID um, join airlines on routes dot airline ID is equal to airlines dot ID let's see if my they finally fixed this in my SQL It won't let me do it because I got a duplicate column name. So we go airport and as airline. And let's see if it actually worked. I think they finally fixed this in MySQL. It's not going to make a liar out of me anymore. And then where. And now I don't know the elevation because I didn't include the elevation this time. But you just see, I just changed my entire view. And if I want to get rid of my view, gone. There, that's view in a nutshell. It actually took longer for me to stop fixing my mistakes than it did to actually create, use, and delete the view. Uh, so, officially, that was the end of the content for the midterm. Um, that's the end of today's lecture. It's actually a short lecture because both these topics are pretty short. Um, you just got some labs to do. The midterm is in class. If you have Cal accommodations, make sure you book time with Cal. I've been told that it might be the same day as Jerome's midterm. And that really sucks. Uh, 
Uh, just for yours. Okay, well, the good news is, if I remember right, the midterm is actually, my midterm is pretty short. It's like 40, 50 questions. It's on, and you got like an hour and a half to do it. And it's on your, it's on Brightspace. So, you know, it's not the end, it's multiple guests. You don't have to write code. Obviously, how am I going to make you write code? Oh, I'm going to, I want you to draw me this, and then you can take a picture. Of, no. Right. I'm not going to, I don't do that in midterms. That's just mean. So, yeah, it's on Tuesday, five o'clock. You basically have the whole two hour period to do it. So, yes. Wednesday, sorry, Wednesday. I forgot what day of the week this was. It's been a long week for Dan already. Um, eh? I'm not going to be here. Are you going to be here? It's a we. It's a reading week. No, no. Next week is review. Midterm is the next week, and then the week after that, you're off. And you have no content from this course for reading week. So that's that. 